by this continuous chronic stress because uh, uh, the, pr the continuation of feeding the hindbrain and not feeding the forebrain causes the forebrain not to develop adequately. So uh, the trade-off is this, uh, you can make a, a very strong, very reactive street fighter at the cost of the intelligence of that child. Okay. We're about to take another break. Would it be fair to say, though, um, that that baby, when it starts developing, if it's not brought up in a loving, supportive environment, would almost be expect um, an aggressive outer world? Well, it, it definitely would be uh, very much uh, uh, shaped by an environment that encourages that behavior because mm -hmm. it's like, it, it's, you know that old story of use it or lose it? Yeah. Whatever aspect of our body that we use the most is the part that develops the most. So a child that grows up in a stressful environment, an environment that's a lot of uh, strife and anger and violence, will use the mechanisms to survive in that to allow it to keep its physiology strong enough to survive in that environment, which then, of course, uh, creates a body that is very uh, reactive and reflexive and ready to respond in a violent mode because that is required for survival. The body will design itself to meet the needs of its survival and violence is part of it, then the body and the mind will create a violent situation to control itself in an environment that doesn't support it. Because that's the unconscious programming that's it had in utero. Totally unconscious programming. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, take a break and uh, we'll come back with Bruce. Glad you stayed with us. We're talking with uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton, and we're talking about a lot of the content of his book, Biology of Belief. I was very interested to read in here, because I'd like to get a little bit of your own personal journey now, before we go back into some of the work you do. What happened at the age of seven? I thought it was a lovely story. <laughs> oh, that's, that was my first introduction to the microscope. Yep. Oh, that was, that was a really exciting time. Mm. Uh, as we were talking about, you know, developmental experiences really shape who we are. And I grew up in an environment that was really not that supportive of myself. So my outer world was not that, you know, rich for me to be involved with it. And I had a lot of inner world experiences. And the first day that I, I looked through a microscope and saw a living cell, I was so amazed to see this living uh, amoeba and a paramecium moving through the field of the microscope and in my young eyes I didn't see them as little cells I saw them as little people in a sense and they had a life down there and I was like peering into their world and watching them and it was really wonderful because the world I was in wasn't that great but the world in that microscope looked much more exciting to me and so I was really captivated by, the, uh, by this life in this miniature form that you couldn't see without a microscope. Uh, I remember I, uh, I went home and I was so excited, I just badgered my mother and father, I want, I want a microscope, I want a microscope, and they bought me a microscope, and I spent an entire summer as that child looking at anything and everything, you know, going to the pond and pulling stuff out of that and taking pieces of my own skin off and everything I could put under that microscope and take a look at it. I really, really loved it. And it was funny because, um, I spent weeks in a row because I wanted to take a photograph of what I saw. So I had a little old, in that old days, a, a brownie, brownie camera. Yeah, brownie camera. <laughs> and I spent day after day, I would take, you know, look through the eyepiece and put the camera, I'd focus where I could see and I'd put the camera on top of the eyepiece, take the pictures and I'd run down to the store and bring the film in and I'd wait two days and I'd run back to the store and then I'd open it up and almost every time, all you see was a big round white spot. There was there was nothing in the picture. I did days and days and days of this, and I'm sure my parents were real happy because they never had to worry about me. I was always caught up in that microscope all the time. And finally, right near the end of the summer, it got to me. It just, it was wonderful because now I think back on it, I was what, seven and a half, eight years old, and I started to realize that by putting the camera on top of the eyepiece, I couldn't see it. But I also realized when I put my eye really close to the eyepiece, I couldn't see it, so I had to move my eye back. And I, all of a sudden it clicked in that little brain 
And I said, what if I just move the camera back a little bit? And all of a sudden I started to get some out of focus, but there were images in it and it was really exciting. And the big surprise ends up, that was when I was seven or eight years old, and, and about like 15 more years, I end up uh, being an electron microscopist. And uh, so, What's an electron? electron microscopist is, it's a microscope, not of the one that uses a light underneath, like the light microscopes we use in a laboratory in a, in a high school, in a college. But an electron microscope is a much more powerful machine. As a matter of fact, the machine I used was, oh, I would say it was about 12, 13 feet high microscope with a big console on it. It looked like a 747 instrument panel. There were gauges and switches, and you did it in a special dark room, and uh, you walk into this room, it was another world. And it was just like uh, being Star Trek. That's what I felt like it. And it was neat because the electron microscope can magnify images like a million times. So a light microscope, I can magnify something a thousand times. But now I was in a, in a machine that could look inside these cells at a million times more of magnification. It was the exact opposite of Star Trek. Instead of going out into outer space, I was going into deep inner space and looking inside the cells and looking at the molecules and the, and the structures of the cell from the inside. And for me, it was the most exciting. I couldn't believe I was, you know, that people actually were encouraging me. I mean, I was in education and I even got paid to, to use this electron microscope because it was sort of like, I would sit there and, and have this joy about me that, my God, this, I go every day and look into a world that people have never seen before. It was like being a pioneer and going into the realms, you know, uh, that people, everything I looked at was n new at that time. People had n not seen half the things I'd ever seen. So it was, uh, it was the greatest joy of my life to be a traveler, but inner space. Mm -hmm. and, and in the end, it was one of the, the greatest things that ever happened because the most important lessons I ever learned from my life was to understand the lives of the cell. And, and that is because just as my little seven you know, year old experience, it turned out to be absolutely tr true. Cells are like little people. They have their own lives. They live in a community. They, they do everything that we do on the outside here. And it's, it's interesting because for the audience so that should know this, is that w when we look at ourselves in a mirror, like I look in the mirror and I see the single individual looking back, I say, oh yeah, that's Bruce looking back. That's an illusion that I am this single living entity because actually I'm made out of up to 50 trillion cells. It's the cells that are the living entity. I'm a community. I'm not a single anything. I'm a, a community, a vibrant community of 50 trillion living entities. And this is what I was doing when my culture experiments is taking some of these cells out of the body. It would be almost like sitting here at the harbor and, and a big syringe popped out of the sky and sucked us up out of this chair and put us into another world. I was taking cells out of the body and putting them into another world and then studying them in that other world. And uh, the information I got back was so exciting because it's like we look at ourselves as being, oh, look at all the great functions of the human, you know, our respiration, digestion, our nervous system, and all these wonderful things. And it turns out there's not one new function in my entire human body that's not already present in every single cell. Every cell has a brain and a digestive and a respiratory system and a muscular system and an endocrine system. And a, every cell has an immune system. And what, what I, I realized at some point is when I was looking inside the body, I was indeed looking into a, a universe of, of living entities that were forming this community called the body.